one. Good afternoon. I'm Pat Living with the Department of Health and Social Services and moderator for the COVID-19 update for Wednesday, September 16th. We are joined today by the Honourable Tracy Ann McPhee, Minister of Education and Justice, and the Yukon's Chief Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Brendan Hanley. Our sign language interpretation is being provided today by Mary Thiessen via Zoom, and André Boursier from French Language Services Directorate will translate any questions from French-speaking journalists. Following our speakers, we will go to the phone lines for questions from reporters. We will call you by name, and you will each have one question plus a second. Before we begin with our speakers, I'd like to verify that everyone can hear us. If any of the reporters are having problems, please email Alexis Miller, A L E X I S dot Miller, M I L L E R, E R, at gov.yk.ca. Thank you. Minister McPhee? Thanks very much, Pat. Thank you to everyone for joining us here today on the traditional territory of the Ta'an Kwachan and Council and the Kwalandan First Nation. I'm really pleased to be here today with Dr. Hanley. It has been uh, six months since the impacts of COVID-19 began to be felt here in our territory. The challenges presented by this pandemic have forced us all to change the way that we live our day-to-day -day lives and to work together to keep our family, our friends, and our neighbors safe. Our government's priority continues to be protecting our territory and supporting Yukoners who have been impacted by the pandemic. We took swift action to put programs in place to support Yukoners, including paid sick leave for Yukon workers and self-employed people who were affected by COVID the COVID-19 pandemic, funding for local businesses that have suffered and needed relief, income support for our dedicated essential workers, and supports to help Yukoners pay rent. These programs are still available for those in need and details can be found on yukon.ca. We have also taken steps to keep residents across our territory safe. Last week, we extended the state of emergency in the Yukon for the second time. This ensures we can continue to enforce measures that our government has introduced to protect Yukoners from the spread of COVID-19. This includes mandatory self-isolation for those entering our territory from outside of British Columbia and the other territories. And it also includes the requirement for those transiting through our territory to do so within 24 hours and to stay on a designated travel route and not to enter into our communities. These are important measures and we take them very seriously. In the past week, we have had six new charges laid under the Civil Emergency Measures Act. These were uh, charges for failure to self-isolate as required upon entry into the territory. There were three of those. Two charges were for failing to act in accordance with a signed declaration. And the other was for failure to remain on a designated route while transiting through the territory. We know that these measures are inconvenient for many, but they have been successful in, spread, in preventing the spread of the virus. We encourage everyone and continue to do so, to do their part in preventing the spread of COVID-19 in our territory, including those who are visiting us from outside. I'd like to remind all Yukoners and visitors to be kind, patient, and respectful to one another. If you have concerns, please contact our enforcement team at covid19enforcement at gov.yk.ca or you can call 1-877-374-0425. It has now also been a month since students returned to Yukon schools. The last few weeks have been challenging. There's no doubt about that. It has taken a tremendous amount of work to adapt and adjust to the new health and safety guidelines for schools, and it has not been easy for anyone. 
I'm very encouraged to see that with patience, kindness, and mutual support of one another, we are seeing staff, students, families, and school communities settle into new school routines. This is a school year like no other, but we are pleased that the majority of our schools have been able to return to full-time face-to-face learning and that all UConn students are able to connect with their friends and their teachers every day. Our teachers have done a tremendous job to adapt with enthusiasm and creativity to ensure that our students can enjoy fun and engaging learning opportunities. It has been a challenge for education systems across the country and in fact across the world to navigate the realities of the COVID-19 pandemic because it continues to be a dynamic situation that changes day to day and week to week. We are very fortunate here in the Yukon to be in a position where our students can return to the classroom. It truly takes a community to raise and educate our children. And I want to thank everyone who is contributing to the successful start of this school year. Thank you to the parents who are helping their kids get ready every day and encouraging them to adapt to new routines. Thank you to the school staff who are keeping our learning spaces organized and sanitized and safe for our students to use and enjoy. Thank you to the bus drivers who are helping get students to and from school safely each day. Thank you to our students for their resilience and courage and determination. They're really leading the way. Thank you for teachers who are finding innovative ways to support and educate their students. More than ever, school staff are finding creative ways to assess and meet students' needs and meet students in their learning where they are. They are supporting students by providing more personalized, flexible learning opportunities that are inclusive of each student's different needs. As we continue to navigate this pandemic, it is more important than ever to reflect and identify the barriers and opportunities that are before us to ensure that students are supported. The Auditor General's report in 2019 recommended that we review our inclusive and special education services and supports for students. This review began in February with a focus on the Department of Education's current practices, procedures, and legislated responsibilities. Some initial meetings with school and administrative staff took place before the pandemic arrived. But broader engagement with students, families, educators, school communities, and our education partners were planned for April and May of 2020, but they had to be postponed. As a result, we're extending this review into the 2020-2021 school year to provide more time and the opportunity to safely connect and gather perspectives. The priority of this review is to take the time to hear and to listen to the feedback from those who use and deliver these services and know the system best, including students, families, educators, school councils and education partners, and UConn First Nations. We are currently uh, working together with the consultant who is leading this review uh, with UConn First Nations and our partners in education to reschedule these opportunities for this fall. These opportunities include an online tool to help safely gather perspectives and experiences, and there will be focus groups of educators, including learning assistant teachers, school counselors, educational assistants, and others. Connection with Yukon First Nations, school councils, and the advisory committee of edu for Yukon Education and other professionals who work with children and youth with diverse needs. Today, we are sharing an interim update on the work that's been completed by the consultant to date. 
This interim update is being shared with families and our education partners and will be posted on yukon.ca today. While we have experienced delays due to COVID-19, we remain committed to reviewing our inclusive and special education services and learning more about how we can support the needs of all Yukon students. We expect the consultant's final report by the end of March in 2021. Again, if I can just take a moment to thank the students and the school staff and school bus drivers and families and all of our communities for your patience and support in supporting students going back to school this year. We all share the goal of ensuring that our students are supported on their learning journeys and we know that we can achieve that goal by working together. Thank you. Thank you, Minister McPhee. Dr. Hanley. Thank you, and thank you, Minister McPhee. And good afternoon, bon après-midi. Tomorrow, as Minister McPhee says, uh, UConn students will have been back in school for four weeks, and students and staff continue to adapt and settle in very well. Every additional day that uh, goes on well shows that our working premise that the best place for children to be during the school year is in school is being borne out. I acknowledge the challenges of teaching and learning in an altered environment, but we're all learning to adapt as we are learning in other aspects of life during this pandemic. One of the most challenging areas we've all been grappling with, whether in our own family lives as parents and caregivers, or as children or as staff in schools, <clears throat> has been in knowing what the right thing to do is when children are sick. For many weeks, I've been hearing about how we are going to sustain a school year when kids will need to be sent home for any sniffle. We have parents wondering about what happens when they themselves need to be at work and are reluctant to take yet another day of sick leave or even if there is any sick leave left. In addition, I know that advice given to different families may have been different, whether to stay home for 14 days, whether just to wait until symptoms clear, or even to return to school with low grade, low grade symptoms. So we have taken on this problem to our team, and I think we've settled on some advice for parents and staff that we expect will offer some relief and some clarity. By the end of this week, all parents should have received a new easy to follow chart that will assist them in determining what sick means for a school child in this new normal of COVID-19. To complement this chart, we've also developed guidance for healthcare providers should they be asked to advise, and this guidance will be available on our website later this week as well. As we all know so well, symptoms of COVID can be very variable in what people present with, and the range of severity can be anything from asymptomatic to critical. But with months of global experience, we have also learned a few things about what is more common and what is more unusual. For example, in general, children have milder symptoms. They will usually have a fever and a dry cough. Gas gastrointestinal or stomach issues are more common in children than in adults over the course of the disease. But not all tummy issues are COVID, and certainly nor is every cough or fever. Add in a few other symptoms like runny nose, headache, or just not feeling well, and these common symptoms become less and less specific for the COVID-19 virus. Just, if, just as we have already seen over the last few weeks, we will be seeing viral activity throughout the season with illnesses such as common colds, influenza, and gastrointestinal infections. However, we also know that children will often get viral Ill mild viral illnesses that resolve themselves within one or two days. All of these other viral syndromes do make it harder to pick up which might be COVID. And keeping a low threshold for testing is one of our key strategies for detecting otherwise unrecognized introduction of COVID into our territory. So how do we balance that radar searching for COVID with a reasonable measure for children and families not to miss school unnecessarily? 
The literature to date, along with data accumulated from some large jurisdictions, does indicate to us which symptoms are safer and which symptoms are higher risk for COVID. Thus, we have created a new tool based on a stoplight approach. But before I go into this, I want to say a couple of things about testing. First, testing is always available and encouraged for anyone with symptoms. But at the same time, we know it may not be practical or even necessary for every person with a runny nose to drop what they are doing and get tested. And by the way, I do note that we've just surpassed 3,000 people testing in the territory for an overall positivity rate of about 0.5%. The second point about testing is that once you are several days into an illness, testing actually starts to become less useful. On the one hand, there's no need to test at the first moment. Uh, uh, sorry, that's on the one hand that uh, testing becomes less useful later on. But on the other hand, there's no need to test at the first moment of illness. Unless you or your child are sick enough to need medical attention, there's no need to get tested at 11 p.m. at night, for example. The test result will not come back any faster. The ideal time for testing is in that first day or two of symptoms. But back to handling your child with their symptoms. The first step is to assess your child every morning before going to school. And in the, in the traffic light approach, and I'll show a quick version of a, of a poster that uh, we've developed with the uh, red, yellow, and uh, green lights. In the green situation, if there are no symptoms at all, this is not surprisingly when you can send your child to school. But this category also includes symptoms where, situations where symptoms may, not, may be consistent with a previously diagnosed health condition and are not new or unusual symptoms. So allergies are a common uh, and good example of this. Now, what if your child has a runny nose or stuffed up nose or a headache or sore throat or maybe just not feeling well? The yellow light category includes a list of these lower risk symptoms. In these cases, keep the child at home and observe for 24 hours. If these symptoms resolve within 24 hours, children can return to school without having a COVID-19 test. However, if symptoms last more than 24 hours, children must either be tested or stay home for 10 days before returning to school. These are situations where the fastest way to resolve the dilemma of what to do is to get your child tested. The one exception is an isolated runny nose. We know that this symptom alone is only very rarely associated with COVID. And we all know how common this, is, this symptom is throughout the fall and winter months. In the case of just a runny nose that persists past that 24 hours, and when the child is otherwise well, these kids can go back to school or daycare. In the red light category, testing for COVID-19 is strongly recommended. These symptoms include cough, fever, and fever or chills, shortness of breath or difficulty breathing, and loss of taste or smell. Even though in our current context, these are also common symptoms of upper respiratory infection of any cause, these are more predictive symptoms for COVID and therefore deserve a higher level of precaution. This is a lot of information to take in just from my words, and we will have the information sheets distributed through the Department of Education, as well as posting to the yukon.ca website to make it easier for parents to read and understand. Probably the most important things to take away today is that a persisting runny nose only after that first day of observation does not necessitate a child to remain at home or out of daycare. A second or more symptom needs to be present. And if a child does need to stay home and chooses not to test, the length of stay has decreased from 14 days to 10 days. This is another area where, uh, with this information, we hope to help keep illness out of the schools, but also to keep children in schools as much as we can in the current context. 
And even in those kids with a runny nose, practicing safe measures within the school context helps to prevent sharing of any virus, not just COVID. To keep COVID illness manageable within the territory, I'd like to remind all Yukoners to practice the safe six, not only here at home, but when traveling out of the territory. The borders within Canada, of course, are not closed, and only a few jurisdictions, including ourselves, are requiring self-isolation when arriving from another province or territory. Manitoba, the three Northern Territories, and the Atlantic provinces. And in Yukon, we have done something different from anywhere else in the country. We have removed a self-quarantine requirement from another major jurisdiction, in our case, the third largest province in the country that we happen to border with. We continue to watch BC and the rest of the country and analyze where we want to go from here and when. But if we want to at least keep our bubble open with BC, when safe isolation is not required upon return from travel there, we're asking that you supersize the safe six when traveling. Again, we expected to see more illness around the world in the fall time, and we could, in Canada, be on the verge of a major second wave. But at a minimum, we're seeing some significant increased activity, resulting in a higher number of cases being di diagnosed daily in many other jurisdictions. BC has seen recent spikes, of course, and while this increase is being attributed <clears throat> in part to large gatherings and individuals relaxing the public health measures, these numbers are continuing to increase. So please remember, if you're traveling outside Yukon, to take your travel manners with you. Remember the safe six wherever you go. Wash your hands. Stay two meters apart from others, not in your bubble. Don't gather in large groups. Travel respectfully. Stay home and away from others if sick. It is important to know the rules of the jurisdiction you're traveling to in addition. Many communities, for example, now require masks in any enclosed space, such as in a shopping mall or other venue. Know the rules and respect them. And when you come back home, be extra careful and extra respectful of the safe six measures which protect all of us. This way, well, we, the way we will likely see an outbreak or further cases in the territory will be introductions from Yukoners returning home. We all recognize the efforts of all Yukoners to stay, to stay safe and to keep COVID-19 at bay, and we and you have all done an amazing job to date. I ask that you keep doing it and that the Safe Six continue to resonate even when they begin to wear you down. These are what are going to keep us safe in the long run, and they may help us keep influenza and other respiratory illnesses also at distance, for this season at least. And finally, someone the other day was asking about the continued importance of social bubbles and groups. And again, the key take-home there is, let's keep our social circles small. By you knowing where you've been and who you have been with, that's the best way for us to be able to do contact tracing if someone does become sick with COVID. That information is of paramount importance to YCDC and community nursing who are responsible for all the contact tracing and territory. If you think about it and if you have time, make a list of where you've been and who you have interacted with over the last three days. That number may surprise you. Someone would have to talk to every one of those individuals and complete a risk assessment or ask them to come for a test if you became ill, if that, were, if that happened to be a COVID illness. And that might have to be a lot more than three days. We are a small community and our bubbles and groups will intersect, but it still remains important to keep that group that you are with most often small. And that's all for today. Thank you, merci. Thank you. Just before we go to the phone lines, uh, I want to check, are there any reporters that we may have missed on the line? I have Marin, Brenna, Claudianne, Tim, and John with us here in the room. Oh, um, this is I'm here. From I'm, News. I'm sorry? Haley Ritchie. Oh, Haley. News. I just joined the call a bit late, yeah. Thanks, Haley. We'll add you in. 
All right, we'll now go to the phone lines and we'll begin with Matt. We'll begin with Marin from uh, La Robe Real. Merci beaucoup. Uh, merci, Dr. Henry, pour uh, les, uh, tous les détails concernant les enfants. Um, tandis que les, um, les magasins commencent déjà à penser à l'Halloween, est-ce que vos équipes pensent déjà aux recommandations qui seront faites pour uh, la traditionnelle chasse aux bonbons? So, Dr. Henley, did your team start thinking about Halloween and what rules are going to be in place for that moment? Oui, uh, merci pour la question. Absolument. Uh, on, a déjà, uh, on a déjà commencé de faire uh, un petit guide uh, sur les activités pour Halloween. Donc, on va, on, on, on va parler plus tard de ça uh, avec les mesures pour appuyer les enfants et les familles uh, pour célébrer uh, toujours dans un contexte uh, de, de COVID le, la, la nuit de Halloween. I'll just repeat in, yes, in yes, English uh, the, question, the, the question about Halloween. Yes, we are working on some uh, some guidance, uh, so I will come back to you with some with some guidance to support children and families to be able to celebrate Halloween, even if in a modified uh, COVID context. Thank you. Avez-vous une autre question, Marin? No, merci. Merci. We'll move now to uh, Brenna, Canadian Press. Here's we've lost Brenna. Uh, Claudiane, Radio Canada. Oui, Dr. Henley, possible de m'expliquer en français, donc, euh, les, non pas ce que les mesures des trois couleurs sont, ça je vais l'expliquer, mais peut-être pourquoi est-ce qu'on est arrivé avec un système pour les symptômes des enfants à l'école? So, Dr. Henley, could you please repeat in French uh, the reasons why you came up with this uh, system of three colors to describe the symptoms of, uh, of children? Oui, merci pour la question. Uh, pour, uh, oui, pour le contexte, uh, on sait déjà que... Um, un domaine très difficile pour, pour les familles, pour les enfants, c'est pour ce quoi faire quand un enfant dans la famille est malade. À, à quel moment est-ce qu'on peut retourner à l'école? Est-ce qu'il faut euh, être subi à un dépistage? Euh, après combien de jours est-ce qu'il est sécure? Euh, toutes ces questions-là ont beaucoup vexé des, des parents, des familles. Euh, J'avais beaucoup de questions sur ça. Et même les, les conseils qui, qui étaient donnés par les, les, euh, euh, les, les médecins, les, les, les infirmières, les autres, sont peut-être pas très consistantes. Donc, on a essayé de faire un guide euh, pour être plus consistant, pour, pour être plus clair sur qu'est-ce que c'est les symptômes où on a plus de soucis et où, par contre, où on a moins de soucis. Donc, euh, avec le modèle d'un feu de circulation, on a les symptômes verts, euh, effectivement, on a l'absence de symptômes. Euh, si on a un feu vert, c'est pour... Euh, on, on, on peut aller à l'école sans problème. Et même ça inclut dans cette catégorie-là les symptômes qui sont déjà connus. Donc, euh, par exemple, les allergies, les symptômes d'un nez qui coule, un tout euh, associé avec une allergie qui est, qui est connue pour, pour cet enfant. Donc, euh, la catégorie intermédiaire, le, 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 le feu jaune, c'est les symptômes qui sont, euh, euh, sont là, euh, mais sont moins, euh, euh, moins prédictifs euh, pour, pour COVID. Donc, sont plus associés avec les, les, euh, les, les syndromes virales euh, de, de journalier, euh, effectivement. Donc, c'est les symptômes que un euh, qui coule, un euh, tout, euh, de, de, de la fatigue, de la malaise. Et donc, en ce cas-là, on, on demande les parents de, de retirer l'enfant de l'école, d'observer pendant 24 heures. Et euh, si les symptômes sont... Euh, si si l'enfant si est récupéré après cette période d'un jour, euh, il peut retourner à l'école. 
Et, euh, mais si les symptômes euh, sont plusieurs et persistent, on est conseillé de, de faire un dépistage pour être plus rapide à décider euh, si on peut retourner quand les symptômes sont résolus, euh, résolus ou sont, sont mieux, sont meilleurs. Donc, euh, c'est euh, une catégorie intermédiaire. Et dans cette catégorie aussi, c'est le nez qui coule comme seul symptôme. Si, il y a, si on a un nez qui colle seulement, l'enfant est autrement bien, on a passé le 24 heures, il n'y a rien d'autre, cet enfant-là peut aller au, à la garderie ou à l'école. Et euh, finalement, dans la catégorie rouge, c'est les symptômes où on a un peu plus de soucis pour le COVID, la possibilité de COVID. Et c'est avec un fièvre, un toux ou le, le mal à respirer. Et, dans, et, et avec aussi l'absence de sensation de, de goûter ou de sentir. Et donc, cette catégorie rouge, on est euh, fortement recommandé de faire un dépistage et puis de suivre les, les, les instructions de, de, euh, de personnes de, dans, dans le secteur de santé pour quoi faire après, pour attendre le, le résultat, pour à, à, attendre la résolution des symptômes euh, avant de contempler le, un retour à l'école. Donc, effectivement, c'est ces trois catégories. On, on espère que ça, ça va donner plus de conseils euh, clairs et consistants aux, euh, aux familles. Thank you. Avez-vous une autre question, Claudiane? Uh, for the Minister of Education, uh, whether the uh, inclusive and special education report uh, will lead to hire of more educational assistance. Uh, this has been a long time request from parents and education alike. Uh, thank you, uh, Claudienne. Uh, it may be that that ultimately is uh, part of the response, but uh, it would have been uh, relatively easy to say, uh, let's hire more educational assistants and continue with the same process uh, that has been in place for a long time. Uh, what we know about inclusive and special education is it is not likely working as well as we want it to. So this is a real review of the experiences of families and students and educational experts uh, as well as educators uh, to determine how we can uh, do this better uh, and ultimately uh, the uh, information that we get through uh, the review of inclusive and special education will guide us on how to improve those services and how to uh, do better in the future. Uh, whether that means uh, additional educational uh, assistance uh, is one part of that puzzle, but uh, uh, I am hoping we will have a, a new path forward and a way that we can respond uh, in very meaningful ways to the issues of students and families uh, by listening to them. Thank you. We'll move now to Tim from CKRW. Good afternoon, Dr. Hanley. Uh, just wanted to, you'd mentioned about uh, the, the BC bubble today and people uh, having to, you know, take your the safe six uh, when they practice that in BC and then when they uh, come back. Can you just maybe uh, address uh, mask use for those who have returned from BC and uh, I'm I am hearing that uh, the people should be wearing a mask uh, for 14 days uh, when they come back. Uh, we actually had uh, Whitehorse uh, City Councilor uh, do that uh, last week. And just maybe expand on that point. Yeah, thank you for that, uh, that question. You know, I wouldn't uh, object to anyone that chose to do that. Um, I also uh, would say that uh, it's not... Uh, it's not entirely necessary, given that it's not a necessary uh, or mandatory measure in BC, nor is it in Yukon. So, um, but if someone wants to take that extra step of being being cautious around, uh, you know, to to show uh, extra caution and to be extra cautious, um, I, I certainly would support uh, would support that decision, and. Uh, it's 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 important that the of of course that the you know that that really the fundamental is the observance of the of the safe six and then avoiding some of those higher risk um, 
uh, or taking extra care maybe to avoid those higher risk uh, social situations. So, you know, just being very careful to observe distancing, to comply with our guidance around indoor gatherings and outdoor gatherings. So it, it doesn't necessarily mean doing anything different. It just means being, crossing your eyes, crossing your T's and dotting your I's with doing what we were already asking, asking everyone. Um, the uh, but there is a component to that 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 there are, uh, we do have um, more strict requirements to people who are working in healthcare settings, um, so including acute care facilities and long term care, and that uh, also affects some of the visitation policies. So that is where, uh, for instance, if. Um, uh, if if a healthcare worker, a nurse or a doctor or another healthcare worker is traveling to BC and then re-entering a healthcare facility, we are asking uh, PPE and and a mask a mask use for those uh, first two weeks. So that is where we're being extra cautious um, with protecting those facilities that are m uh, more susceptible uh, to an outbreak. Thank you. Uh, next question, Tim. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, I think I'd asked you this a couple of months ago, actually, but just in regards to flu shots, is there any consideration of uh, bringing them online earlier than uh, the month of November, and uh, will we have enough supply? Yeah, great question. So we're we're really getting uh, we're getting close um, to um, influenza season, and I, I think uh, there um, we are preparing for uh, late October uh, introduction, and as always, starting with um, fl making flu the flu shots available for the higher people at higher risk. Uh, we have ordered actually uh, double our usual supply, uh, so we are prepared for a higher demand, which we expect to see a higher demand, and we are um, we are preparing uh, in Whitehorse uh, uh, the the facility at the convention center for um, for offering mass immunization clinics in a COVID safe way. In fact, I'll, I'll be going there after this conference just to check in on how preparations are going. So, um, really looking forward to this uh, influence a vaccine um, season. We will also be in the mass clinics and uh, in the uh, health centers when the flu vaccine is going to be offered. We're also going to be offering the pneumococcal vaccine for people who require it. Uh, for, for, um, who, so that's usually people with adults with underlying medical conditions or over age 65 if they haven't already received it. Um, and uh, the uh, the other aspect is that we are also um, going to be having pharmacists uh, deliver uh, vaccines as uh, as an added component, an added way for people to get influenza vaccine. So more details to come on that, you know, in terms of dates and locations and all of that, uh, definitely coming soon. Uh, in terms of start time. Well, late October really is ideally positioned. Uh, you know that you you could argue that if we go too early, uh, you if we look at you know when do we want to have the most durable uh, immunity, um, you, you still want to want to position it um, at, at a time where you can expect to have uh, uh, you know durable immunity well into spring. That the science around that is not is not exact, but. It, it could theoretically mean if that we go too early, you might get waning waning um, immunity towards the end of the season. The other, I think the more probably important aspect is logistical, and that is that you want to be sure you have all the vaccine in the ter territory uh, ready to go in all the places where you're going to offer vaccine. Uh, you've got your supply, you've got your personnel, you have your sites booked, really being well prepared uh, and well positioned to offer vaccine effectively and efficiently is the the more important goal than the than the actual start time. I think the start time is completely um, uh, com is really ideal um, for um, for where we uh, wh for 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 where we anticipate our season to be. Of course, we don't know exactly what the flu season is going to be like. We have not yet had confirmed influenza within the territory, so I think the timing is probably going to be ideal. Thank you. We'll move now to Haley, Yukon News. Thank you. Um, I know there was a plan recently to obtain a couple new buses for uh, school buses. I'm wondering if there's an update on that. 
Sure, I'll take that question. Thanks, Haley. Uh, there has been um, a request by the uh, service provider of Standard Bus to obtain uh, more buses. Um, one of the issues, uh, I don't think they've arrived yet, but uh, we expect them to arrive. Uh, but uh, what's also important to uh, remember is that uh, there have been some staffing challenges as well. So even if we could order uh, many, many more buses, which we can't in Canada, uh, obviously there's resource issues, but more importantly, there is uh, a lot of jurisdictions who are looking for new buses and uh, across the country, uh, but uh, and also looking for, uh, for new staff. So uh, it's a good reminder that we're all adjusting and adapting adapting uh, to the ongoing pandemic challenges um, and uh, to do so with, uh, we hope, patience and, uh, and mutual support. And uh, it's also a good opportunity for me to say, uh, encourage anyone who enjoys working with students uh, and may be currently looking for work opportunities to contact Standard Bus uh, and uh, hopefully uh, provide, uh, well, there is training provided, but uh, hopefully uh, uh, work with students uh, going forward and, uh, and round out the cha some of the challenges we're having with uh, providing a full service uh, that we want for getting students to school safely. Thank you. A follow-up question, Haley? Thanks. Yeah, uh, my other question was the six new charges. Um, I know identifying information can't be shared, but I wanted to confirm that it was three separate individuals and were the two individuals charged September 15th um, traveling to Yukon together? Uh, I don't know the uh, answer to the second part of your question, and I think of the six charges, there were uh, five individuals. Thank you. Uh, Laura from CBC. Laura, can you hear us? She was having some difficulty getting on. Hearing that she's not there, uh, we can follow up with her questions if she wants to reach out to us after. Mm -hmm. I'd like to thank everyone for their time today. Our next COVID-19 update is scheduled for Wednesday, September... Oh, excuse me. Oh, sorry. Are you there, Laura? Sorry, another... I have TBC on one? Yeah, sorry. okay, go ahead, please. We thought we'd lost you. Oh. Um, hi there, thank you. Um, yeah, there, there's been, um, just, I guess this question is for Minister McPhee. Um, there's been some concerns about the number of substitute teachers in the territory right now, uh, especially with more teachers having to stay home if they have any symptoms. Uh, I know the teachers union has said there's been days this year when schools have had, you know, six, six, teach, six, six teachers, but uh, could only get two TOCs in. I'm wondering how your government is dealing with this situation and if the department has hired any more TOCs this year. Uh, thanks. It's a, a great question. Um, of course, teachers on call are an incredibly important uh, part, uh, valued and important part of our uh, education system. Uh, uh, Laura, I think, uh, uh, is uh, maybe new to our territory, but uh, every year uh, we uh, recruit uh, teachers on call uh, at the beginning of the school year, and that number increases throughout the uh, term uh, of the school year, uh, right up until the in probably the highest numbers are near uh, near May, April, May, and June uh, of a, any given school year. So uh, this is no different. Um, we of course need teachers. Uh, on call to fill in when staff are absent and we are continuing to recruit teachers on call through our schools. Uh, there's also online uh, social media, local and federal job search uh, websites and posters in the community. So uh, please, uh, if you are interested uh, in being a teacher on call, you should contact the Department of Education or respond to one of those uh, those locations. I can also um, indicate that, uh, that we anticipate the numbers also to increase over the school year uh, 
when um, some uh, students who perhaps haven't returned to university uh, but might be interested in uh, providing uh, some uh, teaching experience or, or services to the Department of Education uh, may find that that suits their schedule and their uh, education uh, goals as well. Um, but uh, teachers on call uh, have been uh, recruited. Uh, we are working, uh, as you can imagine, day to day to make sure that there are teachers, uh, qualified teachers and qualified teachers on call uh, in every school and respond uh, as, we, as we have in the past uh, when uh, there's been other absences. Uh, we have not seen uh, a market increase, although uh, it is day to day at every school and uh, the school administrations are working hard to make sure uh, the teachers on call are contacted quickly and uh, can respond to the needs of the school. Thank you. Do you have a follow-up, Laura? Yeah, to clarify that question, so have any more teachers on call been hired this year than usually would be? Um, not necessarily uh, more. I'm just looking for my uh, my note. Um, I understand that there are uh, about the same amount as would be in any particular year. Uh, we've got individuals, of course, responding uh, due to their personal lives and their own situations, uh, and uh, and teachers on call um, uh, are, as I've said, uh, a group that increases over the school year. Thank you. Again, I'd like to thank everyone for your time today. Our next COVID-19 update is scheduled for Wednesday, September 23rd at 2 p.m.